Are you excited? Because you should be. We've got an absolute cracker of an episode coming up for you today. Um, on Today on the Ask Historians podcast, we are featuring a lengthy interview with user 400 Rabbits uh, on the Aztec Conquest. Um, now, it's part one of two. Uh, this I've had to split the interview up into two. Um, but first thing, I wanted to get a couple of things out of the way before we get onto that. Uh, first thing I'll mention is uh, I've got a new mic. Uh, great. Lots of thanks to user the Fush, who I can only assume is some sort of sea creature from New Zealand. Um, he actually donated his mic to the podcast. So thank you very much, the Fush. Um, hopefully, I've recorded a few episodes on my, on my previous setup, and we're still catching up. But going forward, um, the audio quality should be should be pretty good. Um, I just wanted to mention as well, I'm aware that my interview technique needs a bit of improving. Hopefully it's not too annoying, but I will be working on less, uh, compa- you know, asking for fewer comparisons and metaphors I'm con- you know, in, in this interview in particular. I, I've realized on, on listening back to it that I'm constantly asking, so is X situation like situation Y in a completely different culture in a completely different context, which, you know, it's one of the things that I find annoying that other people do, but I was doing it myself. So whatever, maybe I was just fangirling over talking 400 rabbits, who knows? Um, so without further ado, we'll take it away. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Okay, so welcome to the Ask Historians podcast, 400 Rabbits. <laughs> Hello, Taz. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Alrighty, so first thing I'm going to have to ask before we move any further, what is up with your username, 400 Rabbits? Uh, so 400 rabbits, which in uh, Nahuatl is uh, the Sinsan Totoshin, is they're a, they're not a singular god. They are they are deities in the kind of Aztec pantheon, uh, and they are in fact rabbits. Uh, and there there are 400 of them, and they are the gods of kind of revelry and drunkenness and uh, happy disorder essentially. Uh, they're they're literally party animals, uh, and they're actually the <laughs> children <laughs> of of the goddess of Magüe, uh, which most people know as Agave. And so since agave, uh, you know, they didn't have tequila back, uh, you know, prior to, you know, distillation reaching uh, the shores of America, but uh, agave syrup will naturally ferment into something called pulque, uh, which is sometimes called kind of agave wine or something like that. Um, and it's kind of this, uh, it's, an, it's a unique experience. It's kind of, uh, kind of like a, if you've ever had like a naturally fermented beer, it's a little bit like that with that kind of tinge of sourness. But, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, getting the implication that I'm getting from when you say it's a unique experience is that you want it to be a unique experience never again. Is that what I'm picking sometimes up? It gets, <laughs> sometimes it gets described as drinking snot. But, oh, uh, is this that thing where they, yeah. they chew it all up and spit it back in the bowl and... No, no, that that's, that's actually that's uh, that's chicha. Uh-huh. That is, uh, yeah, because you have to chew. That's actually from from maize, because you have to chew the kernels, and then the uh, the amylases in your spit break down the uh, starches, so the sugars can ferment. So, uh, welcome to the Ask Historical Science podcast. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah, I will. Um, I'll stick with my scotch and my IPAs. I think. Um, okay, so tequila. Do you have a favorite brand, or do, do, or I, I, let me guess, you don't drink tequila. You drink something way more obscure than that, don't you? Well, no, actually, so uh, I, I do like tequila. I'm, uh, I tend to uh, kind of go around and I, I'm, you know, why drink something twice when you can drink something new? So I like to kind of jump around a whole bunch. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm am, I am a fan of sitting around with an Añejo, which is the aged tequila. Uh, so you may be thinking, so there's actually, uh, tequila is actually kind of like the champagne of, of, uh, of fermented agave uh, because, you know, you can only make tequila from... Uh, a particular kind of agave in a particular region. Everything uh, else is mezcal. Okay. Yeah, right. and tequila. Yeah, and tequila actually also has a uh, one thing different where the uh, where the piñas, the cores of the of the maguey, yep. uh, those tend to be when they get mashed up and kind of and they tend to get steamed instead of roasted. Uh, and like mezcal is traditionally roasted, uh, which can sometimes give it a very smoky flavor, uh, okay. which actually I'm not much of a fan of. But don't tell anyone. Except <laughs> no, everyone yeah, listening to this podcast. No worries. <laughs> Except the hundreds of thousands of listeners that we have. Um, okay, so. Oh, this is a bit of a sidetrack, but do they enforce the naming conventions? Like, I know you're not allowed to call uh, a sparkling white champagne anymore unless it's from the Champagne region, So, but I see tequila all the time in Australian bottle shops, and I can't 
or is that all tequila? Like, is there a massive distillery there, or um, is that just a case? Well, there's, yeah, <laughs> there's there's many, many, many distilleries. Yeah, okay. uh, it, the, you know, the thing is, it has to be made with uh, you know anyone can call it uh, tequila mm. uh, if they want to get you know sued for you know trademark or copyright. Okay, so they do they do enforce that, it, right? Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, but it needs to be made you know particular kind of you know 100 percent blue agave kind of thing. Like ah, that. nice. That's All right. Okay, so your particular flair covers um, the the Aztec Empire. What got you into studying this particular path? So uh, I kind of came to... So I did undergrad in uh, anthropology, and my particular focus is actually on kind of physical anthropology and medical anthropology. Uh, Like my my graduation present to myself was to buy a a medical-grade replica skeleton named Oscar. Because uh, that's a pun in French, Oscar. Um, for anyone who speaks French out there, I don't. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, my archaeology professor uh, was this great guy, uh, and he was a, but he was a Mayanist. And uh, I think by the time I, I like to say, and this is this is going to sound so snooty to everyone listening, but I kind of feel like I got into anthropology. Uh, because I had learned all the history there was, which is a very kind of like, you know, a very arrogant 18 year old thing to say. Uh, but I, you know, I, you know, you go through so many history classes and you go at, you know, and already, I'd always had a, you know, huge interest in history, uh, that I kind of got from my father. who's also a huge history buff. Uh, and so by the time it came to kind of pursue my studies, I was like, ah, I already know everything about history. I don't I need to <laughs> branch out. So I kind of, uh, but it turned out, you know, I don't know everything about history. They really shouldn't but, uh, let eighteen-year-olds make important life decisions, should they? They really, sh- they really should not. Uh, so, uh, but I really, what I, uh, I think, what really I was tired of is that uh, I was tired of kind of like European American history because you know, you, sure, that's what you get all the time. Yeah. So I started taking up kind of an interest in. Uh, basically, uh, the history of the rest. So there's this there's this uh, saying that uh, anthropology, uh, uh, social sociologists study the West, anthropologists study the rest. Ah, uh, okay. And yeah, so uh, I got kind of interested in kind of uh, the non-white parts of history, uh, and so I, I really uh, spent some time with uh, this minus professor, and he kind of turned me on to uh, the Mesoamerican history. And so, you know, I graduated and I was so used to going to the the library every day for hours and hours and hours that I would wake up in the morning and I would go to the library and I would get there and I'd think, I don't actually have to be here, but as long as I'm here. And uh, the library just happened to have a pretty terrific uh, selection of uh, Aztec histories. And uh, to to make this extra personal, uh, the one in particular that I picked up uh, was this uh, book from the 70s called A Reign of Darts by this called guy called uh, uh, Burr Brundage Cartwright. I think it's out of print now. Um, I have a copy, but it told the story of the Aztecs in a a very kind of more narrative way than I'd seen before, because you know, a lot of times when you when you read men's American history, it's you know it's all pot shirts and you know post holes and midden pits and archaeological digs. Yeah. Uh, and so what I think got draw drew me to the Aztecs was that there is really this kind of narrative story there. There's Thank a lot you. of, you know Yeah. Cool. So heart. I guess we'll we'll get on to definitions. What exactly are the Aztecs? Are they an ethnic group? Are they an extent? Like, do you know do, do, do Aztec people still live today in the same way that Maya people live today or um <laughs> Yeah, uh, so one of the uh, one of uh, the catchphrases that I like to shock people is just to say there's no such thing as an Aztec, um, by which there is no, which I mean there is no singular group of people called the Aztecs. Uh, right. The term Aztec uh, simply means in Nahuatl uh, the language that they spoke. Uh, it refers to uh, people from a place called Atzlan, uh, right. and so it's this group of people who speak the language Nahuatl, uh, but not all the people who speak Nah uh, Nahuatl. So uh, it's a subgroup within that language group. Okay. Who share a common origin story? And so there, um, are, there are Nahuatl speakers still live today. Um, oh yeah, there's there's millions and millions in Mexico. Sure. And is there much um, with the history of it? Is there much? I guess uh, nationalist. So one of the things, if you ever are looking into, and I'll I'll go to probably the the biggest is the ample Balkan history. Um, it is really difficult to sort of um, sometimes sort out the truth because you've got a lot of um, sort of competing narratives uh, all the time. And so is, is that the same case? You know, is there a lot of, I guess, sort of Mexican nationalism or um, <laughs> imperialism that sort of comes through in, in, in the academic research? Or is it very much a thing that sort of North Americans um, study? Well, yeah, in term, yeah, well, in, in terms of, uh, I mean, you know, of course, 
uh, as far as nationalism goes, uh, I mean, there's it's still the study of Mesoamerican history and uh, of of the Aztecs in particular is you know it's huge in Mexico mm. uh, because they've got all the artifacts. Mm. <laughs> um, but uh, in terms of more popular culture, uh, the idea of the Aztecs being a central identity to to kind of uh, uh, particularly Mexican self identity is something that's really kind of taken off, and so you'll find you know groups like uh, Mexica Uprising, you know, or, or you know statements like Brown Pride, uh, okay. who you know who say like you know we're not mestizo, we are you know we are Aztec, we are we are Nahuas, things like okay. that. So it, it really yeah it plays into that. Um, all right, so we talk about the Aztecs, so, so that's a, a subgroup within a, a particular language group. Um, and so, was the Az- what you know was the Aztec Empire? How similar was it to empires our listeners might be more familiar with, uh, particularly the Roman Empire, I guess. Um, you know. <laughs> well, that's that's the one most everyone compares. You know, that's that's uh, when people think empire, that's what they think. Yeah. Uh, it's like when people think you know slavery, they think, they think you know American slavery. Sure. Uh, but that's not necessarily the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Aztecs are really what uh, are sometimes called a hegemonic empire, uh, in that really, so the the Aztecs themselves were a subgroup, and then the people that we call the Aztecs were actually three particular groups within that subgroup, uh, and it wasn't really a name that they called themselves at the time, it was kind of backwards applied to them. And those were the, the Mexica at Tenochtitlan, that's the one we really, really identify. Yep. Uh, the uh, Ecoa at uh, Texcoco. And they were kind of the second, uh, you know, they were the second most important group. They started out kind of as uh, as equals. Uh, and then there were the, the Tepanaks at uh, Tlacopan, who uh, gradually everyone just kind of forgot about. They were always lesser partners anyway. Right. So, <laughs> so, so I guess moving it to, say, say the, the British Empire, we might be talking about, um, when we talk about the English, that's not everyone who spoke English, because Scots and Irish also spoke, spoke English, but the English definitely had sort of the power within the British Empire over over the ethnic Irish, um, you might say, even yeah. though they spoke... Yeah, okay. Um, and, and actually, in a way, thinking about Scotland and England as kind of uh, these... these uh, a, a united kingdom, but mm. two kingdoms within it, is, is kind of a good way of thinking about it. Okay. Um, but in terms of uh, how the empire itself works, um, it, think more... Think less Roman and think more Mongol, I guess you could say. That's usually what I would give people as a touch point. Okay. And the fact that really uh, what the empire is based around is that uh, the Aztecs, uh, they would march their armies uh, out to uh, your Altapet, your, your, your city, state, your polity, and say, hey, uh, you blocked a road or, you know, you refused to give us this gift that you owed to us or, you know, you killed one of our tax collectors or our merchants or something like that. Uh, and so now we're going to declare war on you. So they declare war, they defeat you, and then they say, okay, we've defeated you. Now what you need to do, you can keep your rulers, you can keep everything, you can keep living your own lives. It's just that... Um, Periodically, you're going to have to send us tribute, and if we come by, you're going to have to, you know, supply our armies. Okay. And if you need your help for fight, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. So they didn't. So, um, so it wasn't so much, you know, they wouldn't appoint their own governors or their own religious practices or things like that. Um, yeah. It was just as long as you pay us money and do as you're told yeah. when we come through. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's mafia on a state scale, which is really. I, really describes a lot of kind of historical kingdoms and empires, but yeah. yeah sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, well, and, well, no, we'll, we'll steer clear of politics, eh? Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, how long about, was it, when we talk about the Aztec Empire, what what length of period, you know, was it a, um, a, you know, how many, how many decades or even hundreds of years was there a entity c- c- that we could identify as the Aztec Empire? So uh, there's kind of a, there's a pre-imperial period and there's a post-imperial period. Right. So uh, the city of Tenochtitlan itself was founded uh, probably around 1325. Uh, that's in the in the common area era, mm-hmm. uh, you know, AD. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at that point, they and there's a long tragic story behind that, uh, but we won't get into that. But sure. at that point, they were under the domination of a Tepanak group. Uh, and it was almost about a hundred years that they were kind of the vassals of these people before they teamed up with the Ecoa and a different group of Tepanaks to overthrow that original group of Tepanaks uh, and uh, found the Aztec Empire. So, and then, so that's, you know, kind of early 1500s around that period. Okay. So, when we talk about the Aztec Empire, we're talking about a period of about uh, 100 or so years. Okay, so a couple of generations. Yeah, short um, and explosive. Yeah, right. And at, the, and at the top of their game when uh, Cortez arrived, actually. Right, okay. And so, at the top of the game, do we have any idea of how many people were under the, the Aztec yoke, I guess? 
<laughs> well, we don't have a really clear idea how many people were in Mesoamerica at the time. <laughs> anyway, sure. historical demographics are incredibly, incredibly messy, yeah, especially right. when it comes to the Americas. Uh, so most estimates were that uh, Mexico itself held about 15 to 20, 25 million people around that time. You know, kind of... Wow. It ranges out from you know ten to thirty million, so it's it's a very kind of big, broad uh, scope. Yeah. Okay. Um, with the central uh, Aztec area, which is of course the the Valley of Mexico, the basin of Mexico, um, that's kind of that particular area right there is estimated to be about one to two and a half million people. Right. So, um, yeah, we're talking about a, a pretty pretty substantial group of people. Yeah. You know, okay. Numbering in, in the millions. Yep. And so uh, Tenochtitlan was built over with. Uh, Mexico City. Um, so, so to what extent does that sort of impact the the archaeological, you know, and studying when there's you know a, a city of what is that twenty million people in Greater Mexico City now? Um, it's it's I, very very large. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, does that um, because obviously there's a lot of cities like like London and Rome and all the rest of it. You know, there's a lot of very old cities that have been continuously populated. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so, so to what extent? You know, because when I think of uh, sort of Aztec architecture and stuff, I think of massive pyramids in the jungle, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but their <laughs> their larger city, um, I know this is great. You're getting you're getting a um, <clears throat> an Australian's perspective of of Central American and North American history. Hey, um, and we'll go into that further actually. But so so when you know when when I think of this stuff, I think of you know your big stepped pyramids in the jungle. But Tenochtitlan was a massive city, and that's underneath an even larger city right now. So does that impact the... Uh, does it make it harder, I guess, to to discover things? Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. And, and it's not helpful the fact that Tenochtitlan was, <clears throat> was literally built in the middle of a swamp. Um, and that it really... It, it extended its, its way... It's, it extended its city basically by, you know, building dikes and what are called chinampas, which are uh, basically just raised raised beds completely raised out of the uh, the lake floor. Um, because you know Tenochtitlan was obviously it was an island, and then the lakes later got uh, drained essentially. Okay. Uh, and so things had a tendency, even uh, even in the past, to have a tendency to sink into the ground, right. uh, which makes things difficult. Uh, but one of the you know every time I think about uh, 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 excavations in Mexico City, of which there aren't actually really that many, most of them are done kind of on the outskirts on the outside of the city um, where they can, you know, actually, you know, dig up large, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, several acres. Where people um, aren't living. But, yeah, so a lot of the very, very important uh, archaeological artifacts we found, like the like the Aztec calendar stone, uh, have been found, you know, doing things like digging the subway. Uh, so yep. you have, you know, things where you need to, like, you know, you need to put in a new sewer line or you need to, you know, extend the subway and then, you you know, you dig up all these artifacts. Okay, okay. Um, all right, so when we were discussing this uh, via email about what we were going to talk about, um, I thought, how about I get rabbits in to talk about the Aztec conquest? And I know that immediately your heart uh, jumped at a chance to talk about that, that, that most understudied aspect of Aztec history, which was when the white people came over. Um, so, so um, I'm being a little sarcastic here, I guess, um, in the sense of it certainly, it, you know, it's one of the only things uh, that as a casual observer of history that I've ever heard about. But um, so what, what's your take? What's your opinion on the conquest as um, as a subject? Well, it's it's uh, my least favorite part of Aztec history, awesome. um, which isn't to say I, I don't love it. It's like saying uh, it's uh, my least favorite um, uh, wife. Um, right. So, okay. <laughs> Did uh, Aztecs still love that we have our difficulties. Polygamy or uh, polyamory and all that sort of jazz. Uh, yeah, uh, polygyny was actually kind of more restricted to uh, the rich elite, and it sure. was, there was actually. Uh, I, and uh, if we talk about the conquest a little bit more, it was like a huge tradition of kind of political marriages. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, like as Cortez would be going through and making allies, the first thing they, they would do is they would you know give him a wife or three or four, right? Okay. Um, and say. <laughs> You go. You're married now, right? Well, um, we'll, we'll, okay, so we'll get back, back to the conquest. So we'll talk about that. That sounds. Huh. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's. Uh, it, it, but you know, one of the things uh, you know, I, I like to think of myself as kind of like a like a like a hipster historian. I'm like, oh, oh the Roman Empire, <laughs> so overdone. Uh, so, and so you know, it comes to the conquest. I think, oh, you know, this. It's one of the. It's it's probably the only thing that anyone in in schools ever learns uh, about the Aztecs. Um, 
and it's, it's you know it's usually taught in a very particular way. Sure. Where you know there's this you know this gaudy decadent blood soaked empire, and then you know the white people come over carrying crosses, uh, and then you know the uh, the the primitive natives think they're gods, and then you know like you know uh, two dozen people walk into Tenochtitlan Lawn with beards, and everyone bows down before them. And well, then yeah, I was walks. watching Apocalypto, and that was um, <laughs> the, you know that's very much the impression that I get. You know that there's these horrible horrible people, and um, you know they pretty much had it coming because they were they, they seem to be massive yeah. jerks to all the to all the nice people living in the jungle nearby. Um, well, Apocalypto didn't actually portray the Aztecs. Uh, they were supposed to be uh, uh, Maya, although it's it's unclear which Maya they were supposed to be portraying. Um, uh, and I've actually been—I think I've read a post on this, and I, I know uh, that that Snickering Shadow actually has written a, a review of this as well. But the movie is kind of weirdly disjointed uh, in the fact that it it has a tendency to mix architectural styles of the Maya from like a thousand years of span, and then mash them up with like you know the the temple scene where they're sacrificing yes, the person. Yes. Yes. That's uh, they do that in an incredibly. I mean, they, that's basically the way Aztec sacrifices are practiced. You know, you take some guy, uh, you take him up to the top of the pyramid. Uh, you have four priests bend him back and then cut out the heart, hold it up, put it in uh, what's called an eagle vessel, uh, which is just kind of a, a brazier where it, uh, it, you know, where, where it burns. Uh, although they wouldn't actually cut off the head and kick it down the stairs, they would actually roll the entire body down to what's called a blood mat, where the body would then be uh, dismembered. Um, and the head would be put on a a, a, a zompanli, a, a skull rack. So uh, they got that right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> least. So that they was that to, was the Aztecs uh, and not the Maya. Squeak in. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And the Maya. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they so you have wonder why with that movie? Why they? Because they went obviously to a lot of effort to make it look authentic. You know, with with the um, what, what, what language were they speaking in Apocalypse? I mean, this is probably a subject for another cast. Uh, yeah. And it was yanking your chain. Yeah. Well, they were actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, they were actually speaking Yucatec. Which right. is a dialect, of, which is it's not a dialect; it's a language of Mayan. Uh, Mayan is just a language group. So there's like Yucatec and there's Quiche and all, all sorts of other languages. Okay, okay. But, uh, all right. So before we move on to the to the conquest, um, what what are your some of your favorite stories, I guess, or, or aspects of Aztec history to, to study yourself personally? Before we get on to the really <clears throat> interesting stuff to normal people. So uh, I think there's a – I really like the – part of what draws me to it is it is, it's kind of almost soap opera-y backstabbing um, because, of course, no one ever liked the, the Mexica. In their entire history, they were pretty much always the most hated people. They were the last of the, of the Nahuatl groups to uh, actually show up in the Valley of Mexico. Yeah, so I love their origin story where they kind of come in as this kind of like wandering vagrant bandit group and they get kicked out of places and they settle in one place and then they, you know, do sacrifice we, the daughter of the ruler and get kicked out again. And it, it's, Do we know it's what very kind of, direction they came from? Did they come from the north or the south? Or we don't so know. the the idea, there's actually, well, there's there's a lot of research done put into finding uh, Atlan, this kind of mythical homeland, um, and just kind of based more on language analysis and analysis of the, the text we have because after the conquest, um, there are some some texts that uh, people took down, uh, sometimes a pictorial form, sometimes a written form, to kind of you know trace this very early history, which is you know half myth, uh, or sometimes even more than half, and sometimes less than half. Okay. So it averages out. Um, so, but the idea is they kind of came from somewhere to the northwest of the Valley of Mexico. Right. Which itself is kind of opens up into this this vast kind of uh, altiplano uh, above it. Okay. So, so I guess uh, getting back to the story, no one likes no one likes the Mexica. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, not even the Mexica like Mexica. Actually, one of uh, one of the things I uh, that I'd love to talk about it, on some other podcast is actually uh, so there's there's actually two Mexica cities. There was Tenochtitlan, which everyone knows that's the capital, of, you know, the Aztec Empire, mm -hmm. uh, and there was the sister city on its on the same island to the north, Tlatelolco, which was actually founded <clears throat> when a bunch of Mexica at Tenochtitlan, uh, Tenochtitlan uh, said. <sighs> We are so tired of your crap, and went off and found their, founded their own city. And then in 1473, uh, Tenochtitlan and Tlatelolco fought a civil war, and Tlatelolco lost, and uh, ended up governed by a, a military governor right up until the conquest. Okay. So how far apart were they at the time, say, of the conquest? How, apart, how far apart were Tenochtitlan and Tlatelolco? They were basically one city at that point. Okay. Uh, just kind of, yeah. <clears throat> Tlatelolco, essentially, so uh, Tenochtitlan was divided up into four four quarters, which were then subdivided into uh, 20 Kapulten uh, neighborhoods, uh, and Tlatelolco was basically another ward. Okay. So this is quite a sophisticated uh, city, so they had like streets and canals and all that sort of stuff to, to link everything 
together? Oh, yeah, yeah. And Canals so, are a major part, yeah. Right, so the, your, your average person, what sort of housing would they live in? Was it like tenement house? Like, you, you, yeah, how would you so actually house yeah. to live? So, so houses in uh, Tenochtitlan were actually restricted from having, uh, without special you know, dispensation, from being more than one story tall. Right. Uh, so most people lived in kind of <clears throat> a one-story uh, uh, adobe house, um, which is, you know, uh, very easy to repair when, you know, the rains come through because uh, Mexico has kind of a, a dry season, a wet season, which comes important. You know, it's dry in the winter and then pours rain in the, in the summer. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, most people will be living in kind of like a, uh, a multifamily, close-packed, single-story houses. Okay. And the, the sort of the family unit, that, that would that be like a, an extended family that would be getting together or did they yeah. have, they sort of separated by yeah. gender or... Yeah, no, so, uh, yeah, no, it'd be multi-generational, multi-generational is what I meant to, what I meant to say, yeah. Okay, right. So. Okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, let's move on. So, um, no one likes the Mexica, and before the conquest, um, any particular stories you're a fan of? <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> I don't know, there's, there's a, you know, aside from the kind of the origin story, like, that whole thing with the... Uh, the you know when they came into the Valley of Mexico, uh, just just briefly. So they came into the Valley of Mexico. They kicked out of this place called Chapultepec, and they end up taking refuge by the city called Culhuacan, which is this very ancient city that well, not really ancient, but it has ancient ties back to the Toltecs, which <clears throat> are seen as kind of the the you know the the almost legendary forebearers of uh, of the Aztecs. Uh, <clears throat> and the the Culhuacan say, yeah, sure, you can stay here. You can stay in this place that's filled with snakes, and they'll probably kill you all. It's fine. But instead, the Mexica thrive and thrive and thrive, and eventually they say, "Hey, you know, we're you know we're becoming really good friends, really good buddies, and we're helping each other out, you know, and our our people are intermarrying. How about you know, you, the ruler of of Kowakan, give us one of your daughters?" And the leader of Kowakan, uh, the Tatuani, says, "Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, sure." And so he 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 gives uh, his daughter to uh, the Mexica with kind of probably with the expectation that they would you know that this was a political marriage. Um, and yeah, so okay. uh, he is. <laughs> he's so, been invited. So when they to... say give the daughter, that, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Right. They were a little more ambiguous because he gets invited to um, a ceremony, and he shows up and thinking, okay, probably this is going to be, you know, some sort of, you know, it's a, it's a, a wedding. Uh, and he goes into, and as this is one version of it, because there's there's several different versions of this. Um, but in one version, which I think is my particular favorite, because it's just so gory. Uh, <laughs> Is that he goes into uh, this this temple? You know, it's filled with incense, copal incense, and you know, it's dark and it's flames. And uh, he sees what he thinks is his daughter sitting there, so he goes over to talk to her. And it turns out that no, it is a priest who is wearing her flayed skin. Ah, oh. um, <laughs> yeah, which is yeah, which is part of the religious rituals of 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 the Aztecs. Is that you know, wearing the flayed skin of someone would uh, you would be? Uh, it was part of being uh, what's called an ashipla, uh, which is kind of like oh, a a. Yeah, it, like it's an impersonator of a god, so you take on the characteristic of the god. So, uh, and there was like there were feasts uh, built around this. There's like a there was the feast of the Fla- the feast of the flayed men, the feast of the flayed men, uh, which were this essential part. But you know, it's it's a it's it, it was a religious practice, so, and so I don't know why. What did the guy do when he, he saw his, his daughter, some guy wearing his daughter's skin like a suit? Oh, so he went back and. Uh, Gathered up all his uh, his soldiers and drove the Mexica out, <laughs> and that's <laughs> and that's how they found it to Nochilan. Okay, so that's why they moved into a swamp area. Um, yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's why they ended up on an island in the middle of Lake Texcoco. Okay, and what, did they did they on a, you know how did I mean do we know how they expected him to react? Um, did they think that he, they were doing him an honor by um, sacrificing his daughter that way or? So this is, you know, this is way, way back in mm. in the histories. You know, this is, you know, this is early early 14th century. Right. Uh, so uh, part of this, and it, you know, these things are are these stories that we that we have for these this time period are mostly things that are recorded after uh, the conquest, sometimes uh, a couple decades afterwards. Okay. Uh, because the original sources were pretty much all burned by the Spanish, uh-huh. um, because. Yeah, well, yeah, because you know you're all Christian now, so you don't need these stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. Uh, um, so you know, there's there's a lot of interpretation there. Uh, but you know, the if you if you read the different versions, the general idea is that yeah, the Mexica were like, hey, thanks, you know, come participate in this, you know, this very very wonderful um, religious ritual because you know the human sacrifice part is, is something that always gets. Uh, incredibly 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 focused on and yeah, yeah almost to the exclusion of all the things um 
but really, you know, to be sacrificed was was a, a very honorable way to go. So, uh, you know, the Aztec version of heaven, which is where um, uh, your uh, part of your soul goes and follows. Part, of, you know, the, the Aztecs had a tripart soul, but uh, so one, you know, but one part of it um, would, if you died in battle or as a sacrifice, you would go to the equivalent of Aztec heaven. Or if you were a woman who died in childbirth, you would go to the Aztec version of, of heaven, because right. childbirth is basically seen as a woman's battle. Yeah, sure. So. <clears throat> you know, so dying as a sacrifice was, you know, it's like, hey, you know, you may not want, yeah, it's probably not, you know, on your list of things to do this Tuesday, but um, there are worse ways to go. Right. So it, it's, I mean, is it analogous at all to the to the Christian and Islamic concept of martyrdom? <clears throat> well, uh, I think there's actually a uh, a Islamic saying that uh, the devil teaches by metaphors. Right. <laughs> but, but, you know, so I wouldn't actually say that it's analogous, but, you know, you could definitely draw, you know, connections to it where, okay. you know, it, it was a good way to die. Sure. So um, you mentioned there that the, the Spanish burned all the sources. So they, they had, a, had a written language and they had books and things. Um, what did they write on? <clears throat> so there was, no, there was no written language. The only uh, real kind of true written language uh, was with a Maya and particularly the classic Maya. Uh, the, the Aztecs lived in what's called the, the post-classic period, which is about depending on how you slice it, anywhere from about nine to 1200 uh, CE onwards, okay. until, basically until the Spanish arrive. So, um, the, but no, so the Aztecs, this is like yeah. three to 500 years after that. Yeah. Okay. So basically, yeah, the, the Aztecs had no written language, but what they did have were these, um, were these, these pictorial codices, um, where, you know, you, you know, if you've looked around, you'll probably see them, and most of those ones that you see are actually uh, ones that were, were produced after the conquest, because, of course, the originals, you know, were burned. But uh, So you can see they're almost kind of um, visual mnemonic devices. So, you, you know, if you're looking at perhaps, you know, the, the, the story of, you know, how the Aztecs left uh, uh, Atzlan and then wandered and wandered and wandered until they reached the Valley of Mexico, you'll actually see, you know, you'll see a pictorial representation of Atzlan and then you'll see kind of, you know, footsteps and people walking in the, you know, the picture and then the, you'll have uh, a particular sign of a particular town. And so, you know, which is represented by uh, kind of a hill, uh, because the the term Altepet means uh, literally means water mountain uh, for reasons that are very unclear that that just means like city or town uh, so you know so you see representations of you know a mountain with kind of the symbol of the town on top so uh, and there's kind of these little uh, pictorial tweaks that you'll see so uh, if they're portraying someone talking you'll see what's uh, what are called speech speech scrolls. So you'll see someone sitting, and then you'll see kind of this uh, this kind of cloud coming out of their mouth. It's like a and speech bubble someone in, talking. in modern comics. Exactly, yeah. It's just, it just happens to be blank because there's no writing. Okay. Oh, right. So it's just... Okay, right. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll move on. Um, so the conquest. Uh, give me a bit of a context. So immediately prior to the Spanish showing up, um, what was the geopolitical situation, I guess, in the area? I mean, that's actually you know, that's actually a great question because um, most accounts of the conquest usually start with um, either Cortez landing in 1519, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe they'll go with the Grijalva uh, expedition the year before, or maybe the Cordoba expedition the year before that in 1517. But I think to really understand what happened in the conquest, you really have to go back to um, not too much farther back, but you have to go back to um, 1515. Uh, and in 1515, uh, the ruler, the, the Tlatuani, uh, which just means speaker, or first speaker, or he who speaks, um, uh, and it's usually just translated as king. Um, so the, the king of, of Texcoco, which of course was the uh, second most important city in the Aztec Empire, uh, died. And this was, a, this, was a, this was an incredibly major event, because uh, uh, this ruler, Nezahualpili, um, had been ruling for a long time, and prior to him... Uh, the rule before him had been his father, uh, Nezahualcoyot, uh, who was actually one of the founders of the Aztec Empire and is this, you know, legendary figure, uh, you know, kind of dual role of, of Solomon and, and Leonardo da Vinci okay. in Aztec history. Uh, so Nezahualpili was, you know, carrying on that legacy, and then he died, and there was really no clear successor. So was it and so what happened? to be to his yeah. son, or no, go on. Oh, actually, well, yeah. Here's the thing: these uh, uh, the Tlatoque, uh plural Tlatoani, uh, they were elected essentially. And mind you, it was kind of a rigged election because you know the selection was always always made by the mo by the highest highest uh, elites, right? Um, and right. it almost entirely always came from you know the ruling family anyway. So, um, uh, and 
Did so they have instance, did in, they have anything yeah. like a, a council or a senate or something like that of nobles? That, yeah, um, yeah. So uh, the so the what we know the best, and this you know it varied from city to city, but uh, in Tenochtitlan, the idea was that the the ruler would be advised by um, four um, by a council of four. Uh, and then there would be all these other kind of upper nobility that he draw upon as well, and then there'd be these lesser nobility that you know were not quite so important, but could you know kind of could do, I guess you'd say administrative roles. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, was there so much mobility between yeah. that, or was that fairly rigid? Or we don't know. So as as uh, in the early period, especially um, when the Aztec Empire was first set up, yeah, there was there was significant. Uh, there was some pretty significant kind of social mobility, um, because uh, a commoner. Could rise up the ranks of you know social, economic, cultural, all of that by um, basically succeeding in battle. Um, you know, okay. if you take four captives, you can you know you might be eligible to join into the the military orders. Uh, and if you you know do a bunch of you know heroic deeds and perform well in battle, you can become what's called uh, uh, sometimes called an equal noble, uh, 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 qualpili. Um, and those were basically kind of like life peers. So essentially, you were elevated to the ranks of nobility, but it didn't necessarily pass on to your children. Okay. Um, but you could get around that by, you know, marrying into a noble family then. So. Okay, sure. Sorry, I'll keep on <laughs> interrupting you with these little side questions. But um, So go on. <laughs> okay. So so the um, the old king died. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, then and the was, Starks yeah, was, yeah. sent someone down to King's Landing, right? Always <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ned Stark had uh, five different sons. Oh, so, right. Okay. Yeah. So um, the idea was usually what would happen is that, um, or at least in in the line of, of uh, kings, you know, the line of the kings of Tenochtitlan, it would pass from uh, the ruler to his brother until there were no more brothers, and then it would start back over with the the first ruler's son. Okay. Uh, and you know, we only have about you know, <laughs> you know we have you know like a handful of 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 you know we have only about two hundred years to track this through. So it's you know there. We can't quite draw the clearest pattern, but that's how it that's how it played out. Mm-hmm. Um, with Nezawapili, he had these these, you know, apparently he had no brothers left, so he had these. Uh, um, it's usually set as five, but sometimes the, the number is a little unclear. Um, and in particular, there were these. Uh, there were three sons who were kind of all up for for election. Um, there was Ishlo Shojit, uh, uh, Koakonach, or Koakonoch, uh, and Kakama. And essentially what happened is that the Mexica kind of rigged the election. They basically came in and said, look, okay, this is, this is who's going to be on the throne. It's Kikama. Don't argue with us. Um, and that actually started um, a little minor civil war. So what happened is that Ishlil Shashit ended up taking the northern half of the lands of Teshkogo, while Kikama held on to kind of the more central southern part um, as kind of almost a, a, a Mexica puppet ruler. Okay. Uh, and that and that split uh, was still ongoing. Um, it wasn't, you know, of course, active fighting, but it was still ongoing um, when Cortez entered into the Valley of Mexico. Right. So, was there much? Uh, was the because one of the interesting things about uh, the Roman Empire is looking at the difference between the Roman uh, sort of conquest versus the social wars, where it's Romans fighting essentially other Romans. Um, where was there an element of that at all with with this sort of civil war? Uh, did they change their battle practices at all when they're fighting? Essentially, other Mashika, or not really. Well, um, one thing that it's kind of uh, comes down through through the histories is that uh, at a certain point, the the Aztecs reached, in general, they reached kind of critical mass, hmm. um, where they could marshal more men um, with better equipment because you know they had all this trade and tribute flowing in, um, and spend and have and spend more time training people than anyone else in the region. And so, um, when it came down to it. These, you know, this wasn't like a huge, huge civil war. It was more of kind of a, a, a series of scuffles and skirmishes. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so it wasn't, yeah, so it wasn't like a, you know, a valley tearing civil war. It was simply, okay, you get to a point where, you know, you've done enough damage to make your point and yep. things kind of reach equilibrium. Because no one wanted to destroy uh, yeah. their own stuff, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, like I said about uh, you know when they when they went out of the valley to conquer places. You know, again, the emphasis is not on you know raising it to the ground, although they did do that on occasion, uh, and then just repopulate it. But the emphasis was on just kind of getting someone to admit defeat. Yep. Okay. Uh, sort of a, a prestige thing. Um, all right. So so we've got sort of like a a, a bit of a bubbling um, civil war um, that's died down when the Spanish arrive. Um, what did the Spanish arrival look like? Um, most people will have heard of Cortes, but was he the first Spaniard to sort of 
arrive in in modern day Mexico? No. So the the first person actually the, so the expeditions were setting out from Cuba, um, which at the time was actually you know almost a fairly new colony itself. Mm-hmm. Um, Cortez had actually participated. He had initially come to um, the Caribbean uh, to Hispaniola and had set up there for a few years before joining an expedition to basically um, uh, colonize Cuba. Okay. And so Cuba had only been around for you know a, f- a few years at that point. Um, and they started saying, well, what happens if we sail further east? Because uh, sure. you know they had seen reports and things like that. So uh, the first expedition was actually in 1517, right. and it was led by this guy named uh, it was led uh, by this, this this guy named Cordoba. Uh, and what happened is that they, they sailed to. If you're familiar with the the, the kind of geography of the Yucatan, uh, they basically I'm sailed not, but let's to. Let's pretend that I am. <laughs> let's pretend you are. <laughs> Listeners, call in now. Tell Taz what the Yucatan looks like. Um, That's so the, the big thumb the that juts out into it. The Yucatan <laughs> Peninsula is the big thumb yeah. that juts out into the bay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, his expedition and pretty much every single expedition after this um, followed this basic same route, where he sailed to kind of the the northeast corner of the of the of the thumb, mm-hmm. um, and then kind of. Um, skirted along the coast, making occasional stops, and it was only, I think, if I recall correctly, it was one ship, um, with maybe you know a couple dozen guys, and so they didn't have very many supplies, and one thing they hadn't counted on, and this this actually um, becomes a rather serious problem for them, is that they, they need to keep stopping for water. Mm. Because the Yucatan, the, especially the northern part, is, uh, it's, it's all limestone, and the, there, there are no rivers. Uh, all the water basically trickles down and forms into these kind of underground uh, lakes called cenotes. Okay. Um, lakes, springs, pools, things like that. So if you don't know where the water is, uh, you are not going to find it. Right. So they kept having to, you know, s- you know, stop and you know, try to look around and find water. And the idea was just that they were, you know, supposed to go around and kind of scout and look around and see what was there. Um, and they start running into, you know, and they, they stop and they start looking around and they start getting attacked. <laughs> and they're not prepared for that because at this point, the Spanish had really only encountered um, the people of the Caribbean, uh, which were not near as, as uh, plentiful or organized or um, kind of, you know, this kind of level of social stratification organization that was present um, in uh, Mesoamerica. Right. And so, you know, like one of the, one of the things that um, the early explorers said was that, oh, we found people wearing clothes. Uh, and that seemed to amaze them. So, okay, so that was a big um, deal, because yeah. previously... Okay, right. Yeah, a little bit of weird ethnocentrism there. Um, and also one of the things that they wanted to know was, uh, in later expeditions was whether or not the Yucatan was an island. So, yeah. but, that's, but I digress. Sure. So uh, what happens is that, you know, they, they go up and they reach about... Um, they kind of... Uh, they, they, round, they round the thumb, uh, and eventually they get to a point, they get to a larger settlement where... Uh, they, you know, stop the night and they're hoping to, you know, get some water, uh, and they're driven back onto their ships by this, you know, very large mast attack. Um, and so, and this kind of actually um, was kind of really the first major battle between Spanish and uh, Mesoamerican forces. And the Spanish initially had this advantage because, uh, you know, guns and crossbows and cannons are uh, quite useful. Uh, yeah. But they also one of the things they have is that they they tend to have longer ranges. Um, even even the uh, the matchlock rifles that the Spanish were using at the time and basically used throughout this in the entire conquest, hmm. um, they didn't have longer ranges even if they were much slower reloading. And plus, they have that you know kind of shock and awe effect. You know, if you've never seen a cannon go off, it's very very impressive and loud and smoky. Yeah, it'd be terrifying. Um, yeah, but you can also immediately see the Mesoamericans kind of adapting to that. So um, the reports and the reports of this this first expedition is that they you know they get this massive attack. Um, uh, these these Maya come rushing into them, uh, close with them, and they're driven back by you know the uh, you know steel and you know, by the uh, by the weapons and guns and things like that. And so instead they just draw back to um, to a kind of uh, a missile range and just start pelting the Spanish um, with sling bolts and uh, arrows until you know the Spanish have no choice but to just keep retreating back onto their ships. Yeah, sure. And, and this expedition was a disaster. <laughs> it brought back virtually nothing. Cordoba, who led the expedition, um, actually made it back to Cuba and then died um, from his wounds. Um, about half the people who actually went on the expedition, you know, also died there, um, and you know, pretty much all of them came back with wounds. Some who would die later. It was, it was, it was a disaster. Right. So of course, yeah. So and and that happened about uh, uh, kind of mid 1517. 
Um, so of course, the next year, when the winds were favorable again, um, the another expedition was was mounted, and these were all being sent out by this guy called uh, the the governor of Spain, uh, Diego Velasquez, who becomes kind of a, a player in this story. Um, so he uh, aims to set another expedition. So he gets so he you know, gets more men um, and more ships, and this time they have a a, a Maya who they had captured on that first uh, expedition, who they had been teaching Spanish so they can he can interpret for them. Uh, and they kind of go along the same route, this time being a little more cautious, a little more cautious, and uh, and they find some friendly areas, and uh, and they take more precaution. So they they kind of scout further up the coast till they reach about what is present day Veracruz, which is on the um, the eastern Gulf Coast of Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they stop there, and it's actually on this expedition that the Spanish first encounter. Uh, evidence of, of the Aztec Empire, because as they stop, as they're going up the coast, um, these people come and look at them and, you know, walk up to them and hand them these very rich gifts, uh, and, you know, they don't understand what they're saying. No one understands what anyone's saying at this point, because they've now kind of sailed beyond the, the Mayan-speaking region. Right. Um, <laughs> so, I just, oh, thank you, yes, oh, oh um, yes, gold feathers, things like that, thank you very much, you know, here's, here's, here's things for us as well. And so, they, that's when they first kind of get the idea that there's probably something very, very rich out there. Yeah, sure. So, so they saw evidence of the industry and the well, things like mm-hmm. that. So gold yeah. mining and treasure and things like that. Okay. So, but uh, Grijalva takes his time getting back, um, and he actually takes, you know, he actually runs over. So, of course, uh, you know, what does Diego Velasquez do? Sends plans another, another expedition. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the expeditions will continue until morale improves. So... <laughs> And in this case, um, it, it's supposed to be you know an even larger expedition. And this is Cortez's expedition. And um, so the the best information we have on Cortez um, comes from his secretary later in life, uh, this this uh, this this man named Gomara, uh, who wrote um, a history of the Indies, a history of the conquest, and a history of uh, of, of well, a biography of Cortez, all kind of rolled into one. Uh, so uh, and Gomara tells these, uh, you know, tells these stories about how Velasquez and Cortez just never, never liked each other. They hit it off uh, poorly almost immediately. But uh, Velasquez gets convinced by people near to him who are fans of Cortez to pick him to lead the expedition. And Cortez, you know, kind of wheedles his way into Velasquez's good graces. And then immediately Cortez, uh, who was who was a fairly wealthy man at the time anyway, because uh, he had, you know. He had had this kind of a uh, uh, kind of a government vision on Hispaniola, and then he had had uh, you know large cattle and grazing lands in Cuba. So Cortez immediately starts spending huge amounts of his own money and borrowing more to make this uh, an expedition you know twice as large as the one before. So you know if the Grijalva expedition went out with four ships, Cortez is going out with you know ten to eleven. Right. Okay. If they went out with you know 150, he's going with uh, 450 men. Right. You know if they brought you know two horses, he's bringing 16. You know, 14 cannons, 16 horses, you know, 30 crossbowmen, you know, 15, you know, muskets, things like that. Okay. Uh, the, the numbers vary depending on the sources, but, you know, it's around that. So, and the idea that he had was that, okay, so if the problem is that they have to keep putting into these, you know, these potentially dangerous areas to scout for supplies, I'll just bring extra ships with extra supplies. Uh, right. So immediately you can, you can see that, uh, you know, Cortez gets a lot of credit for being uh, kind of a forward-thinking, kind of clever guy, um, which, I mean... Uh, you really can't deny that you know he he was kind of uh, he was he was a smart and he was he had a great ability to think on his toes. Okay. The problem is that he starts putting together this the expedition, and the more and more he puts together this expedition, the less and less Velasquez trusts him, because Velasquez, his idea was that, okay, Cortez, you have this expedition, your mission, and your legal mission that I'm giving you, is to. Uh, sail to this new land that we, you know, that we we now know as Mexico, but they just call it, you know, it was just this land over there, um, and do some trading, find some of our guys who have been captured, and maybe, you know, if you find a good place, set up a trading post, and then come right back. Um, with the kind of expedition that Cortez is putting together, Velasquez does not think that's possibly uh, how it's going to happen. So uh, Velasquez. Um, puts out an order to arrest Cortez because he thinks that uh, Cortez is going to kind of break that mission. Uh, Cortez gets wind of this and takes off early. <laughs> and right. thus, the Cortez expedition has begun. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so immediately Cortez is kind of um, breaking the rules and out on his own. <laughs> yeah, okay, so he's, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's this sort of character, so he, 
I mean, I keep on um, referring to this, but he sort of ho- he, he was uh, sort of burning his bridges, I guess, a bit when he when he headed off, um, hoping that he'd find something good to bring back. Um, yeah, uh, to keep him out of jail. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, his his biographer actually calls him um, uh, words he uses are things like restless, haughty, mischievous, quarrelsome, uh, but also like you know bright and clever. So you know he's a he's a guy who had a reputation of being um, precocious. Right. So uh, so he starts so Cortez uh, and his expedition starts following the same kind of path that the previous two had gone around. Um, you know, kind of learning from their mistakes as they go along. And but uh, one of the most important things that happens. Is that they stop in what's kind of present-day um, Tabasco, the, the state of Tabasco, which is kind of where uh, the coast of Mexico um, scoops down and then starts heading up into the Yucatan. So it's kind of the the, the I don't know, like the the elbow or the armpit of, of the, Mexico. The webbing, I don't want to say the webbing of the thumb. <laughs> the webbing, the webbing of the thumb. I I'm sorry, people of Tabasco. I didn't mean to say you're the armpit of Mexico. Um, so uh, yeah, and while he's there, um, this is the first time that we really see. <laughs> this kind of oh okay yes we're friends now here's some gifts you give us gifts by the way here's some women you now have you know either servants wives whatever here's, so what would, here's what would the Spanish give us gifts or was this a one so uh, thing? no this is definitely a one this is definitely a two way thing um, and the, the Spanish were giving things that they didn't think were particularly important uh, but then they were getting things that the uh, that the the indigenous Mexicans didn't think that important anyway you know it's like gold is great yeah but you know but also like here's some gold but also here like you know here's some feathers and here's some obsidian and the Spanish would give things like uh, bolts of cloth and they would also get bolts of cloth and back uh, and they would give glass uh, these very kind of glass bead ornamentals and then uh, they would give things like uh, like knives and you know little pieces of uh, like sewing needles and things like okay. that so yeah, there's this there's this exchange going on. It's not just uh, that they're getting gifts for free, but they also are getting gifts for free because mm. um, gift giving is both kind of a, a way at this time to kind of uh, welcome someone um, and also to kind of get them to go away. So if a if an armed group of men shows up at your doorstep in you know in uh, post classic Mesoamerica, um, what you do is you say, hey hey, I'm glad you're here. What great friends we are. Um, <laughs> tell you what, um, here's some gifts. Go away. Yeah. Okay. And and yeah, you were uh, and you were saying that women would be included in those gifts. Yes, and this is actually a key point because at this point, um, Cortez, one of the women, uh, is the woman who is now known uh, uh, as Malinche, um, which is a, a kind of a perversion of the of, of the Nahuatl name uh, Malinsen, which it comes also from Malinali, but we'll just call her Malinche uh, or Malinche. Um, although she's uh, in called in most of the Spanish records as uh, Marina or Dona, uh, Doña Marina. And this was actually a. She was not an. She was not an Aztec, but she was a, a speaker of Nahuatl um, from one of the kind of non-Aztec aligned groups in uh, kind of southern Veracruz. Um, who and this is the story that's come down to us of. And it's it's kind of um, there are parts of it that are in doubt. I guess I could say. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the general biography of her is that uh, she was the daughter um, of a ruler of a town or of a of a small city. You know, right. in Altabat. Uh, who her father died, her mother remarried, and the new father said, I don't really want, you know, yeah, okay. I, I never really wanted a stepdaughter. So, so they weren't uh, slave women as such or anything like that, but they, was there, I mean, it's, it's hard when you're talking about things like consent and how 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 keen yeah. were they to and do this, but... Yeah, and it really, I mean, it's it's not like they were being sold off as, as sex slaves. These were, they were being given as, as almost as like domestic servants. Right. Um, although they're definitely... Uh, there's huge amounts written on kind of uh, how the conquest was also a very um, rapey affair. Sure. Uh, and there's actually a part where the Spanish complain to uh, Cortez that uh, when you know the female slaves are being divvied up after all the after they've taken all these slaves, that you know the Cortez and the captains have taken all the pretty ones. Right. Um, Great. Which you know yeah. kind of blatant brazen things like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Cortez actually ended up um, basically. Uh, having uh, Malinche basically as his wife and the son he actually had with him or with with her uh, uh, Martin Cortez um, actually inherited his lands in Spain so okay so Cortez they're, they're, didn't have yeah. a, a Spanish wife back home or anything like that oh no he had a wife back on Cuba oh, of course um, of course he did yeah. yes yes um, rules are for and, other people you know, he picked, <laughs> yes exactly and he picked up a few wives as he went along as well and he never actually married uh, Malinche he actually um, just lived with her and had a son with her and then eventually married her off to one of his captains so um, was was Cortez um, a particularly devout Catholic at all or was it more he was like an, an ethnic Catholic um, 
Uh, it's if that's a it's hard. Question. I, you know, it's it's uh, it's a complicated question because it's hard to divorce that from um, from. And that's kind of a, applying our kind of own anachronistic ideas sure. about religion to them because at that point, you know. Uh, you know, we always get these questions on and ask historians like, you know, were there ever atheists in the past? Yeah, yeah. Which it's it's hard to say because the idea of what an atheist is now is a very much different thing in the past. But sure. um, from from all accounts, you know, everyone on this expedition was incredibly incredibly about. Um, you know, this is coming just uh, just a few decades after the Reconquista, mm-hmm. where the Spanish had finally driven out you know driven out all the infidel Muslims from Spain, um, yes. and so there was this very martial Catholic tradition. Uh, and uh, to this, and in fact, um, you really can't understand uh, the conquest of Mexico without understanding uh, the requerimiento, uh, the, the requirement, uh, which is this legal document that was drawn up in 1513. Uh, and it is, it is a wonderful look into the mind of of kind of a conquistador mindset. Uh, so it was drawn up in 1513 because the idea was, well, you know, all these Spanish are going over and taking all these lands in the Americas. What what justification do they have to do that, you know, to take it away from people living there? Mm-hmm. And so this document was drawn up, uh, and it was just this kind of short statement that was supposed to be read in Spanish, of course, um, to <laughs> native peoples when you encounter them. Yeah, sure. Um, and its basic message is, look... Um, all things, you know, God has dominion over all things. Uh, the church is, you know, the the agent of God on uh, on, on the earth. earth. Uh, the pope, yeah, the pope is the head of the church, yeah. uh, and the pope has given these lands to the king and queen of Spain. Therefore, native people, you are already subjects to the king and queen of Spain, and also you need to convert to Christianity. Right. And if you don't, um, we're then we're going to consider you in rebellion. Uh, as rebellious infidels, and I guess we're gonna have to, you know, kill all your men and take all your your uh, women and children into slavery. And right. it would really be your own fault for not so, recognizing the fact that so, you are already subjects. So, so they framed it in the sense of these people so, are traitors rather than enemies. If, if that, you know, in, in yeah, the way that you treat captured um, people and things. Uh, huh. Yeah, they weren't, you know, in yeah the Spanish mindset was that you know, not that they were you know conquering these lands, but that they were. Um, basically bringing these people into the legal framework that, you know, they had already been established. Exactly. You know, you were already our subjects. We just, you know, we just need to make it official. Sure. Okay. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Cortez is, um, he's noodling on up the coast and finding uh, more and more evidence of the Aztec Empire. Yeah. And so, uh, this woman, uh, Malinche, actually becomes vitally important because she speaks with Nahuatl and Maya. And previously on the way, he had rescued... Uh, an earlier shipwrecked sailor, uh, Spanish sailor, who had been living uh, with a Maya group who spoke Mayan. So now he had a way to speak to this, this sailor in Spanish. The sailor would then speak to uh, Malinche in Maya. Uh, and then uh, Malinche would talk to people in Nahuatl. Right. And then it would that game of telephone would come back. And so this actually is the entire way the conquest is carried out. Right. Uh, and so, you know, in all these, in all these, particularly in the Spanish accounts, there are these kind you know, of long, beautiful speech passages, and you have people having these very natural conversations, and it's all bunk. Because um, <laughs> it's you know, all forehand. <laughs> yeah, well, it's yeah, it's it's not that you know these kind of interactions didn't happen, but they definitely did not happen in the very kind of smooth way it happens. In fact, there's um, so when Cortez actually sails further up the coast to where is now the present day city of Veracruz. Um, which is kind of you know further up further up along the coast. Mm-hmm. Um, he meets these uh, these group of people called the the Totonacs, who were actually had been subjugated by the by the the Aztecs, and they of course spoke Totonac. And so at some which <laughs> which um, um, neither Malinche nor this uh, nor Aguilar the the Spaniard spoke. So there had to be an additional um, kind of person who spoke both Totonac and and Nahuatl who could then speak Nahuatl to Malinche and then Malinche could speak in Mayan to Aguilar and then Aguilar could speak in Spanish to Cortez but and then this back wouldn't have been a unique problem like with the trade networks this is a, something that they would have had to do deal with all the time in a sense wouldn't they um, did they have a sort of a trade language at all um, uh, uh, so no uh, Nahuatl was actually kind of a lingua franca right uh, in or a lingua, or a lingua Nahuatlteca yeah, um, sure. in that you know it there had been kind of this, uh, starting around you know 800, 900 um, uh, CE, there had been this massive expansion of Nahuatl people down through um, 
Mexico. In fact, uh, there's there's a group of people in Central America who speak Pipil, which is actually um, a very very closely related um, um, language group. So it's it's really uh, and especially as the Aztecs expanded, you know, it really became kind of this thing where there were, you know there were Nahuatl groups, and if you didn't speak Nahuatl naturally, then you know it, you could you know it, it was probably your second language, things like that. So, okay. but uh, yeah, but this whole kind of game of telephone is uh, one of the things that that uh, as we'll see. Um, basically, the story of the conquest is the story of a series of accidents and misinterpretations, <laughs> and this didn't help. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, all right. So moving along. Um, yes. So he's found these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, okay. So Cortez lands uh, at present-day Veracruz, and then he founds the city of Veracruz. Um, which is actually a very savvy political move on his part because he knows if he goes back to Cuba, he will be arrested and uh -huh. you know possibly you know thrown in the, thrown in the brig or you know executed for treason or whatever. Right. But his but his initial mission, if you recall, was to go out, find some captured Spanish, do some trading, maybe start a trade post. Ah, so, so he sets up the he, trade post. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So he sets up the trade post, um, and then he says, "Okay, my mission is done." And then he appoints a town council. The town council then appoints him as a independent captain and gives him a new mission. Um, <laughs> okay, right. So he's, yeah. he's playing the politics like a fiddle. Yes, and he actually uh, and he writes what's uh, known as the so Cortez. Uh, his most famous accounts are the five letters of Cortez uh, to King Charles of Spain, um, Charles V. Mm -hmm. And this first letter is actually not written by him, but is written by that town council. Um, basically explaining the fact that oh yes okay then we completed our mission and you know and now we're appealing directly to your Majesty you know for the authority to conduct you know further uh, exploration and trade and conquest because we don't want to go to Velasquez because you know what he's really greedy and we don't think he has your best interests in mind and he's uh... probably just gonna keep all the gold for himself so you know here's some gifts that we've gotten and we're giving them directly to you not through this greedy greedy Velasquez and so some guy jumped on a boat and tried to skip Cuba and sail all the way back or yeah absolutely um, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, actually, he was actually so uh, an expedition is sent, and because of because of the way the winds go, um, you can only kind of sail from Mexico to Cuba and then on onward to Spain at one time of year, and then come back only at one time of year and make it yeah. worthwhile. So Cortez knew it would be quite some time before you know this message got there. Mm. So he kind of had this this grace period to kind of do what he wanted before you know he got like a, a yes or a no. Sure. Before, um, so he sent this yeah. Up with him. yeah. Yeah, so he sent this guy back and told him actually to, to not to go to Cuba, but of course he stopped at Cuba on the way and almost got arrested, but managed to actually um, escape and flee all the way back to Spain. Right. Okay, <laughs> so he set up um, he set up his little town, and he's got his little puppet council, I guess, rubber stamping all this stuff, um, yeah. and he and he heads he heads west then, I guess. Yeah. So at this point, he's well well aware that there's this. Uh, there's this kingdom of Mexico who has this very incredibly rich, rich person, mm. um, because he's actually met um, the tax collectors of um, of the Aztecs. So the one of the biggest presence of of Aztecs in the conquered town were uh, the Capiche, who were the uh, who were the tax collectors. Right. Uh, or the, uh, and so these people come and they end up scolding the people of, of uh, uh, Simpuala, the Totonac town that he's that he is kind of allied with. For you know, feeding and housing these weird strangers, um, all the while sending you know messages back to uh, to Nochilan saying, "Hey, these people have shown up," and they send them drawings and they send you know a description of them. Uh, and so, um, what happens is that you know these these tax collectors come, and they and they scold the rulers for housing the Spanish, and the Spanish and the Totonacs just you know they capture them, they seize them. And Cortez says, "Oh, look, oh, I'm, I'm very sorry about this. This wasn't my idea. It's those." And this is a this is a pattern he will play out again and again. He convinces uh, and helps with seizing these people. And then when he does, he comes to them and says, oh, this was not my idea. I'm so sorry this happened to you. Tell you what, I'm going to let you go. You go tell uh, your king in Mexico that I am a friend and I'll come see him and everything will be wonderful and we can have you know tea and crumpets. So, what? And this is the pattern of place out again and again. So he releases them and then um, with, with almost no um, support from... Uh, his kind of his new native allies on the coast. He starts heading inward um, because he's always he's already helped them uh, helped his his native Totonac allies um, kind of put down one of their one of their you know uh, nearby rivals uh, pretty easily because the, the Totonacs were not exactly well known for their their military prowess. Right. And so the idea is that 
this has been argued over, like, you know, why did he, you know, why did he set off, you know, towards the interior with, you know, basically just some porters? He really didn't bring any native troops along. Um, well, you know, why did he do this? And the idea is just like, well, probably just a bit overconfident. He probably thought, okay, it's fine, you know, I've, I've got, you know, I've got my cannons, I've got my horses. The you Lord know, is I've on got, my you side, know, three, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So he sets off and immediately, uh, um, uh, well, not immediately. First he has this long walk where he starts running out of supplies and he feels, and everyone gets grumpy. Um, uh, and then, but he, he reaches the territory of, of, the, uh, of, of Tlaxcala. Uh, now the Tlaxcalans were also uh, an, a Nahuatl-speaking group. Uh, they were, in fact, Aztecs themselves because they shared that same common origin story. Okay. And but they had always been independent of the Aztec Empire, and in fact were one of the main rivals. Uh, and they were really, they they were too kind of powerful and dug in to kind of be conquered outright, um, without being you know extre- exceedingly exceedingly costly. Yeah. Um, but they didn't. They themselves didn't have the strength to you know, even you know come close to defeating uh, the Aztecs by themselves. Mm. There, there was kind of this stalemate going on, um, and so, and this is actually a very common uh, strategy in you know Aztec history that they were slowly being encircled and trade was being cut off from that that region. Okay. And by the time Cortez showed up, the the region had pretty much been completely encircled and was now. And in fact, that's one of the things that the the Tlaxcalans actually said to Cortez is like. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we're cut off from all these things, and you know, we don't get good trade, and we can't get good goods, and we're cut off from you know great food, and it's just horrible and horrible and horrible. But at that point, um, they don't know who this person is. Uh, all they know is that there are these weird-looking people riding giant deer, uh, as as the the horses were initially called, mm-hmm. because of course there were no horses in in America, um, at least not for a thousand thousand years. Mm. Um, and certainly not in living memory. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so uh, these very strange, you know, these incredibly strange people with strange customs, strange languages, everything, who had appeared suddenly out of the East and landed and, you know, were had, had already gained a reputation for kind of fearsome fighters. But, you know, now they're walking through your territory. Oh. So the Spanish walk into this uh, this ambush. Uh, and this is, and the way they tell it is that, you know, they're walking along and, you know, all of a sudden they're just swarmed by thousands of thousands of 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 Tlaxcalan forces wearing uh, red and white, which is kind of the particular colors of, of uh, this kind of major general, Shiko uh, Tinkat. Okay. Um, and taken unawares and also <laughs> vastly outnumbered, the Spanish have to kind of fall back to a defensive position. And they're om- it's almost like a microcosm of the of the Aztec and Tlaxcala conflict where the the Spanish don't have the ability to really to defeat their opponent. Yeah. To escape or really defeat their opponents, but also they've they've drawn back in this defensive position where they can use their you know their cannons and their crossbows and the occasional cavalry charge to kind of break up any attack that comes. Right. But they're being ground down. They're running out of supplies. They're they're at a point where it's they're kind of stalemated. Hmm. Um, and they manage to use a cavalry charge to kind of break out and get to um, an uh, an undefeated village nearby where they resupply. But they're they're still being pretty much followed. Um, and there's, you know, what happened, what, what occurs next is basically kind of a, a series of this repeating over again. Um, the Spanish get attacked, but, you know, they, they fall back into defensive position and they retreat. And then, you know, the troops follow. Um, and while this is going on, um, the, uh, the rulers of Tlaxcala, which is it's sometimes called a, a republic, um, because, you know, the rulers were elected from these four different um, major kind of divisions of the city, uh, and in kind of a you know you know a, a, almost a you know a republic style where you know there's several hundred you know key nobles who elect leaders and yada yada yada. Okay. Um, yeah. But uh, while this is going on, the leaders say, "Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Why are we fighting these people? <laughs> you know, this is <laughs> this is this is a this is a potentially you know bountiful arrangement for both of us." And so they they send this peace delegation to the Spanish, and again, you'll you <laughs> there's this. There's this kind of duplicitousness where the peace negotiation comes to the Spanish and says, oh, "We are so sorry you got attacked. It was a complete misunderstanding. It wasn't us. It was those crazy Otomis who were another ethnic group uh, right. in the region. You know, it was. You know, we're so sorry. <laughs> it was just a huge misunderstanding. Tell you what, let's be friends. Come back to our city. We'll talk it over, uh, and you know, maybe maybe we can uh, do some good deeds in the future. Yeah. And so, you know, for the, the Spanish don't really have any options here. Mm. Uh, and even though, so at this point, they've actually brought a couple of the uh, emissaries 
uh, and you know, tax collectors slash emissaries that arrived on the Gulf Coast from Tenochtitlan to kind of uh, make a negotiation and kind of just to see who this was, who this group was. So they have Aztec uh, ambassadors with them who, who say, no, don't do this. These are our hated allies. They're duplicitous. They're evil. Um, if you go in their city, they're just going to kill you, and you know, it'll be very disappointing to us, and you'll make yourself an enemy of us. And But at this point, Cortez doesn't really have an option. He can... Um, not make an alliance with Clash Gallons and have them, you know, slowly grind down and kill him, or he can not die. So it's it's kind yeah. of, um, yeah, it's it's a really tough choice. Well, an, an obvious choice, though, I guess. <laughs> so, um, so he goes in, and there's a there's a there's a series, especially in uh, Cortez's account, where you know he describes a city and he go in. And, you know, there's this giving of gifts and uh, giving of wives, and Cortez <laughs> does his thing and. This is uh, and this is kind of the pattern that plays out in, in almost every single kind of uh, conquest or early Spanish colonial uh, meeting where the Spanish come in and say, "All right, you're all subjects of the king, and you should all be Christians now." And the uh, natives say, "Sure, sure thing. You want to set up a cross? Go ahead and do that. Hey, hey don't touch your idols." Right. And so the Spanish, when they had when they had the power, when they when they were the ones on top. They would cast down idols and clear out temples and set up churches inside of them willy-nilly at mm. the at first thing. But in cases where they're on kind of their back foot, you know, they would kind of say, hey, maybe you should be Christian. Okay. Maybe? Yeah. On your own time. So that sort of presented um, in a more henotheist way in that our God is yeah. a powerful God, <laughs> but we're not saying that you don't have gods as well. Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. You know, kind of a, a more diplomatic way of saying, well, we can't force you, but could you consider it? Yeah, okay. And so what happens next is one of the more um, debated and investigated um, portions of this whole conquest. And you know, mind you, this is, uh, this is, this is a, in the context of a huge swirling kind of uh, ongoing Mesoamerican politics. So in between uh, Tlaxcala and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the Aztecs were a couple of cities, uh, Huishotzinco, Alishko, and, and most importantly, Cholula. And those cities have kind of been a buffer zone, and occasionally they flip-flop back and forth between their alliances with Tlaxcala, and sometimes they were on the side of the Aztecs, and sometimes they were, uh, sometimes they were independent. Um, but just the year that Cortez had landed, just a few months before he had landed, uh, the Aztecs had managed to flip Cholula onto their side. Uh, Cholula, which had you know, most traditionally been an ally of the Tlaxcalans. And so Cortez is wondering, you know, uh, he's still saying to the to the Aztec ambassadors, no, look, this thing with the Tlash Collins, it's just of convenience. I still want to meet your, you know, the still want to meet the great Lord uh, Montezuma, and you know, uh, and you know, talk to him and make you know make great alliances with him and let him know that he's now a vassal of Charles V, um, and then should convert to Christianity. So he's wondering which way to go, and the Aztec ambassadors say, oh, you need to go um, the southern route um, through Cholula. And the Clash Callans say, no, 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 you can't trust those Cholulans. They're terrible people. Uh, they're just trying to deceive you, and they, you know, don't go that way. Go the northern route, you know, through our ally, Huishotzinko. And it's not particularly clear why Cortez eventually said uh, he'd go to Cholula. Uh, in his own letter, he's a bit oblique about it. Uh, he basically says, well, it seems like a big city, and it'd be good to see, and it seems like a great place to get some uh, supplies, which is uh, kind of an odd idea, you know, for why to pick that. It, it just didn't seem that he had a, a pressing reason to do that. But he goes, and he, marks down, he, he marches down, and in the Spanish accounts, this is basically how it goes. Uh, he marches down with uh, several thousand Tlash Callan allies. Uh, he reaches kind of the outskirts of the city and is greeted warmly by the Cholulan elites who say... Hey, you know, we're glad you're finally here, but you, you know, you need to leave all these clash gallons. Uh, you can't bring, you know, thousands of our enemy troops into our city. <laughs> right. And Cortez says, "Okay, that's fine." Yeah, and he goes in uh, into the city, and uh, for the first few days, is treated very, very well. There's, um, I think it's actually in uh, Bernal Diaz del Castillo's account where, uh, when they go into the city, uh, he specifically mentions that each each man gets his own turkey to eat. Uh, which you know, <laughs> just, chicken in every hooray! pot. <laughs> exactly, yeah. uh, turkey on every bowl. So, um, but then after a couple of days, the you know these provisions stop, and you know Cortez and his troops ask for provisions, and they're told you know, and they and they're Time given you know firewood, firewood and water. Yeah, uh, and 
Yeah, and there's there's some various ideas about this. One is that one has proposed that well, he arrived during a festival which you know which has several days of fasting. So it's kind of like showing up, you know, in you know in Mecca during Ramadan, you know, and then well, like during midday the saying like that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly, and saying, hey, you know, where can I get a, a you know a steak around here? Yeah. So uh, the other thing, and this is the way the Spanish accounts go, is that the uh, Cholulans had gotten word from uh, from from uh, Tenochtitlan to ambush and kill the Spanish uh, because obviously they were now with the Tlaxcalans. Right. Uh, and so the the Spanish. You know, say that oh, we saw you know people digging pits in the street and lining them with stakes to you know kill our horses. Which why would why would Mesoamericans do that? Do that? They, yeah, they had okay. never yeah, they 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 had never seen horses before. Um, you know, or they were stockpiling rocks on top of buildings to you know get us. And they were barricading streets and people were looking at us shifty. Uh, and then there's this very famous in- incident where a, a woman comes to Malinche and says, Malinche, you know, look, you're you're you know you're a lovely young girl. girl but you should really come stay with me because tomorrow, um, you know, those Spanish you're with are going to get killed. Right. So and, this you know, is like the, you know, the the ancient or the the Aztec variant of the the text messages that all the Jews were supposed to have received. Before. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so what happens is that, um, and there's a, there, you know, the thing with this is that there are various, you know, each person has their own axe to grind in telling this the, the mm, story of the conquest. Mm. And it, and it never shows more clearly... There are no neutral observers. Um, <laughs> there are no neutral observers. Uh, Cortez's letters are the earliest, 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 um, and most first-hand accounts, but they were written back to the, you know, the king in Spain, justifying everything he was doing. It was, sure, it was sure. a game of politics. Um, his, uh, his secretary, Gomara, who wrote this the biography of him in the history of the conquest, had never actually even been to the Americas. Um, he met Cortez when Cortez came back to Spain and basically wrote down what Cortez told him. Um, and he has this, uh, and Gomara, you know, famously, it's basically just a hagiography of, sure. of Cortez. It's, you know, it's Cortez is the god king who made everything happen and made everything work. Like Caesar's letters back from Gaul. It's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, with very much <laughs> yeah. with a purpose of um, telling a particular yeah. narrative. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, it's it, well, it's almost as if uh, you know Caesar's letter back from Gaul or Cortez's letter back to Spain. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. This is like if if uh, Octavian had written a history of Caesar. Sure, sure, Gaul. sure. <laughs> it's it, very, very unbiased. No, no conflicts of interest uh, there. Yeah, none whatsoever. Yeah. And then the third most famous account is um, uh, a soldier who was with uh, Cortez, uh, Bernal Diaz del Castillo, and that's probably the most famous account because he's kind of it, it kind of synthesizes a lot of the past accounts because he wrote it last. Uh, right. Because he wrote it as a very old man, and he wrote it specifically. Um, it's called the true history of the conquest of New Spain, oh. which would give you an idea of what he was getting at. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, yeah. And so he specifically says that you know Gomara got plenty of things wrong. Let me tell you, you know. And in several cases, you know, there are literally like these kind of cranky old man asides where, you know. Uh, Bernal Diaz uh, del Castillo will start describing something and he say and Gomara says it happens like this but Gomara is so wrong Yeah, he uh, wasn't there he's, man <laughs> it's, yeah precisely he in fact basically says that exact same thing right yeah okay um, but you know there's also the idea that uh, uh, Diaz del Castillo might have actually just kind of um, you know because it was decades after this occurred may have done a bit of plagiarizing of Gomara anyway and then kind of given his own account yeah sure so He's there got to make sales no somehow. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then there, of course, you know, Mexica and, and Nahuatl accounts that were collected after that, uh, after the conquest, which had their own slant on things. <clears throat> and so, in the Spanish account here, what you have is um, this kind of scheming attack, you know, being plotted by the Aztecs on the, you know, the Spanish. And supposedly, uh, you know, uh, Moctezuma has sent an army of perhaps 20,000, perhaps 30,000, perhaps 50,000, perhaps 60,000. <laughs> accounts kind of differ on this. And in fact, in, uh, in uh, 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 Diaz del Castillo's account, there's already 10,000 Mex- uh, uh, Mexica troops inside the city, uh, which, have, right. which apparently magically vanished. Uh, so what the Spanish do is that they... Um, there's a couple different versions, but what happens is they end up rounding, in their account, they end up rounding up everyone uh, into this main plaza. And one of the reasons they give for this is that they say, okay, all right, fine, we're leaving now. We're going to leave tomorrow. Could you make sure that we have lots of porters and that you send all your important people to send us off uh, so we can all say goodbye to you and, and you know, leave ride. in proper style? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, and so what happens is that the Spanish have all these people, uh, unarmed people, gathered in uh, the central plaza, 
and then Cortez has a shot fired off uh, as a signal. Uh, the entrances to the plaza are blocked, and then over the next uh, few hours, they basically start mastering the city. Oh, man. Uh, and, yeah, and in Cortez's own account, uh, they killed, you know, 6,000 in the first two hours, uh, and then fanned out through the city for the next few hours, and they call in the Tlaxcalan allies who start looting and burning everything. Right, so the, the Tlaxcalans come in enthusiastically. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, okay. And that actually brings us to um, what, the, what the native accounts say which say that uh, the Tlaxcalans tricked Cortez into going down and declaring war on Cholula as punishment for um, flipping over to the Aztecs. Okay. Yeah. So there, it, so, it, I mean, it, it's, it's one of those things, and you try and do it, uh, you try and avoid presentism coming in, but it's a natural thing to try and look for goodies and baddies in, um, in any sort of yeah. story. <laughs> and this is one of those ones, you know, again, just from the brief research I did in preparation for this interview, and it's just like, good guys or people who you really want to identify with and say, you know, if I lived back then, I would be on this side. Uh, they're very hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> no, and the thing about the, the thing about the, the conquest particularly, but also really kind of generally Aztec history is that there's no good guys. There's no, uh, there's, there's no one on, there's no one really admirable, you know, in this. On, on the one hand, you have kind of a, a you know, a, even by their own account, a fairly uh, brutal, bloodthirsty, you know, empire on, you know, bent on expansion. Yeah. On the other hand, you have uh, the Aztecs. I mean, okay. Um, hey. <laughs> no, but they're, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, see they're what really you did there. They're, yeah. <laughs> they're really, yeah. Everyone here has their own self-interest that they're looking out for, and there really isn't anyone on the right side of history here. Everyone is kind of self-interested and more than a little bit of a jerk. Mm, mm. But which is why mm-hmm. it makes it such an interesting story, I guess. Um, Absolutely. But anyway, so this is so this is is this this is the massacre of Cholula. Yes, this is the massacre of Cholula, which right. is overshadowed later by uh, 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 the massacre of, uh, of Toshkat. Um, but this is kind of, in in my view, this is basically the conquest in in a nutshell, at least the telling of it. Where you know, there are, you know six different stories, you know in you know there's six different accounts, and each one tells a very different story. Nice. Um, and there's some general themes that run through them, but. You can just see how um, where everyone's self-interest comes into it. But anyway, so uh, after this, um, <laughs> Cortez finally uh, heads on into the Valley of Mexico. And uh, by this point, it's kind of early November 1519. And he actually, uh, both, both accounts, uh, both the native and the Spanish accounts say that he was greeted on the causeway. Uh, to Mexico, because Mexico is, of course, an island city, so there are these, these causeways that go into it. Mm, mm. Uh, he's greeted on the causeway. Um, <laughs> Can we take a quick pause? Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. Dog. Okay, so that's going to be it for this week. Um, I'm going to leave you hanging with Cortez and the Spanish about to enter the city. What will happen? Who knows? Um, spoiler alert, everyone knows. But anyway, it's still really interesting, so tune in next week to hear the second half, or second part, I should say, really, of, of this interview. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to leave your feedback on the discussion thread and ask any follow-up questions that you have. And as always, join us on askhistorians.reddit.com. Cheers. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over 100 historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at askhistorians and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com Thank you very much for listening, and join us next time on the Ask Historians Podcast. Podcast.